I'm told that this is the yeah. biggest crowd so far at the show. This is the biggest one he's seen. He would know. So I'm just going to check. Yep. So, so, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Walter Day, and uh, I've been who? <laughs> and I've been in the video game industry, culture, community for a long time, actually, for 37, 36 years. I started Twin Galaxies a long time ago, and I saw, I saw the birth of this incredible world of competitive gaming, not only as a sport but it's an actual community that developed a culture. So this culture has grown over all these years, and it's very interesting to watch the different individuals who really peopled this amazing community, this amazing culture. And some of these people are like Billy Mitchell and Todd Rogers, who may or may not be in the room right now. And we're going to discuss a bunch of things with their career and their legacy. And I've watched this amazing process grow of the, the video game players become more and more prominent. And as they became more and more prominent, they became friends to lots of people and also became sort of like icons who were leading the gaming community for even the whole world because people from other countries be aware of Billy Mitchell and Todd Rogers and other people. And uh, the thing that impressed me the most, because I was older than all these people, so I watched them grow up as kids. The thing that really impressed me the most was how good of people they were. So they weren't just video game players. They actually were good people who did a lot of good things for a lot of people and really uh, helped engender a global community, a friendship. And as time went on, I saw that this whole thing was not about the video games or the pinball games anymore. It was all about the amazing culture of friendship and camaraderie, camaraderie and community that developed between the people. So I watched this happen with Billy Mitchell and Todd Rogers, who are going to do a lot of talking today, uh, you know, be some of the center people for this whole amazing phenomenon. And as time went on, not only were they amazing friends to everybody and, and loved for all the good things they do, they actually also became... Uh, what's the word for it? Like ambassadors, like people who would represent to the outside world the whole context of the gaming community, the gaming culture, and they would be often chosen as uh, the most likely people to, to be interviewed to talk about the gaming culture, the community, and the, the, uh, the camaraderie. And so they became ambassadors, too. So I watched this process happening from these guys being little kids playing, with, playing under the Twin Galaxy system, growing up to becoming... Uh, good people and then ambassadors for the whole community. So I was very, very impressed with that. And that's one of the biggest things that I've taken away from me being the person who founded Twin Galaxies 36, 37 years ago. That. And, uh, and as time went on, I became more and more aware of how important these personalities were to this culture. And now it's come a time where a lot of the old original things from the original culture are being questioned and challenged and stuff like that. And Billy's the one who's under the, the firestorm the most, along with Todd Rogers. And I, I've never really been in front of a crowd to give my own personal testimony. But in all those years that I've ever worked with Billy and been doing contests that he was involved in or doing promotions he's involved in or doing scorekeeping. I had personally never, ever seen him be involved with MAME, which you folks have all heard that he allegedly has played his games on MAME. I testify that I personally never saw him be involved with MAME. And so this is completely a mind-boggling bunch of confusion to me how this could have been perceived that there was MAME involved in his scoring. And I personally believe at this point in time that it's because the technology that's being involved with researching whether MAME's involved or other kinds of gaming systems involved is just still in its infancy and has not been really figured out yet, and there's still more to be uncovered. For instance, Todd Rogers, who they said could not get a score on barnstorming of a certain score, and so they, they threw his score out. Just a few weeks ago, someone broke that allegedly impossible score on barnstorming that he did, and and that's simply because they didn't have enough knowledge about how barnstorming could allegedly be played 
And so that's an example of how I believe more stuff is about to be uncovered. But no one knows the story better than Billy and Todd. And so I just wanted you folks to know from my perspective, as being the person who watched it all begin and see the step-by-step -step progression of organized gaming and then also the expansion of the culture, which grew into community, how I saw these individuals, these sterling individuals, be a main part of that culture. And they're here today to talk about their legacy and how they, well, start talking, Billy. I was hoping you could repeat that. Okay. Everybody ready? I'll repeat from the beginning. Just kidding. Okay. Okay. Um, the first thing I'll do here is kind of an explanation. It's kind of an apology. I'm here against the very, very strong legal advice. I was told not to do this, and I said, too bad, I'm doing it. The compromise I gave him, and I'm just asking you, and nobody's going to throw you out, but I'm asking, and this is the exception here, take all the still pictures you want, please ask any question you want, and I mean you're here, ask questions, okay, but I ask that you don't record anything. Um, that's just kind of what I agreed I would ask, and if you do, I'm not going to tackle you and take you outside, it's just... Um, the fact of the matter is, I met Walter in 1982, and we've worked hard, collectively, a group of us, to advocate for video games. And we have. Um, geez, there's so many points here, I don't know where to begin. So I'm going to be begin with Todd, and I'm going to tell you what I know. And this is the first time I'm actually saying this, I apologize to Todd, because while his situation was unraveling over months, not only did I not pay attention or pay any mind to it, I was barely aware of it. And the reason why is I don't have any internet presence whatsoever. Every time I come to a show, somebody says to me, oh, I friended you on Facebook. No, you didn't. Yeah, I did. I go, no, you didn't. Billy, I wouldn't lie to you. I wouldn't lie either. I don't have a Facebook. Now, if you search, as someone recently did for me, there's about seven Facebooks for Billy Mitchell, and some of them are quite flattering. <laughs> One of them wrote an email to Walter, and he had been operating the Facebook for many years, and it was really nice. It was like the nicest one. And maybe it was just time, and the guy said that he wanted to surrender or turn it over, if that's the right way to say it. And I don't think he ever has yet, and I don't know who the guy is. But I've been seated on the couch with my daughter, when she's been there, you are not Billy Mitchell. Yes, I am. No, you're not. He's my dad, and he's sitting next to me. There's even one for Billy Mitchell's hair. <laughs> so as Todd's situation was unraveling, I wasn't aware of it until the final week. And during, that, during those final times, I started talking because... For some odd reason, when I speak in the classic gaming world, it tends to get listened to, for better or worse. And I don't, I don't do interviews. I challenge somebody here. Somebody, raise your hand and tell me the last time that you saw me do an interview. Where was it and who took it? You don't have to turn around. There's not a hand in the air. I don't do interviews. I don't believe in journalism. And when I got phone calls about this, I didn't really do any interviews because you copy something that was released to Variety magazine, you paste, and that's journalism. And I'm as good as journalism as anybody. So what I would have done is it would have been, Billy Mitchell says no, and here's the story. So no, I don't give anybody that satisfaction. So here I am gonna do this, and you're in for a ride. Because when I do do interviews, I don't, I'm not easy to interview. Um, I will not give you my opinion here under any circumstances. Anything I tell you here, I can back it up in writing. I can back it up in independent testimony. Documentation of somehow. There will not be any according to Billy Mitchell. But if we go back to Todd for a second, basically his dispute that was done over Dragster. It's the oldest standing world record. In some of the naysayers in the world, 
but they don't like Todd. Todd is an achieved, an achieved game player. He goes to events. He has fun. He has recognition. And the keyboard warriors who never come to these events, you've never met one of them. Okay, they don't like that. They don't enjoy that. So how was it that they could take Todd down? Well, they challenged his so-called impossible score on Dragster. They challenged a score that was 36 years old. And when, it, when I heard it was going on, I just, so what? I don't care. You shouldn't care. But as time went on, unfortunately what he did was he tried to satisfy the questions. He tried to jump through the hoops. And again, the deck was stacked against him. So when I did do an interview on this, I explained the fact that it was 1982 and I had never met Todd. I was in Florida as he was in Florida. Picture 1982, I mean the height of classic gaming. And I was going into Life Magazine, one of 16 players in the world. And I heard about a guy in Florida, and I was traveling around the state of Florida, who got an impossible score, what they dubbed an impossible score on Dragster, a 551. To insult myself a little, picture my state of mind. Yeah, sure he did. Yeah, sure. That was in the spring of 1982, and I had not yet made any contact with Walter. Fast forward to the early summer of 82, and I heard about this guy who supposedly did a perfect score, uh, better than a, an impossible score on Dragster. Yeah, yeah, I heard that story. No, he did it in Chicago this time. He did it at the convention. He did it in the Activision booth. And then my response was, oh. It wasn't anything I could doubt. So now we're in the latter part of the summer, and I hear about the guy who did the impossible score. I says, yeah, I know, I heard that story. What is somebody showboating? Imagine that, me accusing somebody of showboating. <laughs> this time it was, no, he did it again in the Activision booth at the Detroit show. Okay? And he is now paid to play video games by Activision. He's the very first person that was ever paid to play video games. And think about the state of mind. I was 17 at the time. Everybody wanted to get paid to play video games. Everybody did. We didn't want to do anything else. Actually, you don't like that. I was first paid in 1983. Boy, it sucks being second place. <laughs> but anyway, so I heard that story, but I never met him. It was all the way until 2002 when Walter walked him into the restaurant that I actually met him for the first time. And I reflected back and I knew that story. We can talk about the so-called engineers who helped go over his score. The so-called engineers that examined the game and its possibilities. The so-called engineers who said 551 could not be done. Okay, we're gonna forget about the fact that an engineer in Germany did a, instead of a 451, did a 447. Let's forget about that because they said the engineer made a mistake. Let's forget about it. I know, and I would bet my life, that he got a 551. Sorry. Hmm? Does that mean you want me to stay sitting down? Never I mind. think Walter has the, he's got the So the fact of the matter is, oh yeah, it's simple, extremely simple. And when I explain this in the media that I'm going to explain to you now, I guess I came off as a threat. Because number one, I don't get intimidated easily, as you can see. And as I explain to the media, and, unfort and fortunately or unfortunately, I tend to get listened to, mostly because I don't explain very often. It was 1982, he walked in to a city, to a convention he had never been to that was already set up. He walked in, he sat down to play. He played in Chicago in front of a group of witnesses, in front of a group of media, in front of a group of Activision executives, 
with photographic evidence that went to Guinness and did what they dubbed the impossible score. There's a reason why it's called the impossible score. Yes, it should be that difficult. Now, two months later, he went to Detroit. He went to Detroit where, once again, a show that's already set up in a city he's never been to, walked into a booth with Activision executives, a different group of witnesses, a different group of media, a different group of document, documented photographs off the Guinness. And he did a 551 again. The fact of the matter is, I, there's nobody in this room that would have the courage to raise their hand and say that they think that's possible, that that happened twice by mistake. The fact of the matter is, I don't know what happened. For example, and I'm open to the fact, the controller that you play in the very earliest versions, even demo versions where they're sold at the show, that software, that hardware, that could be a little different than what was produced eventually. That was brought to my attention as a possibility. I guess that's possible. It could happen. Probably didn't happen, but it could happen. Somebody said, what if Activision stacked the deck in Todd's favor somehow in order to grab the headlines from the show because he did grab the headlines. He was on top. That's even less likely. Okay? I don't know what happened. Sorry for the voice. I don't know what happened those two days. What I do know is that in front of two separate, separate sets of witnesses, two separate venues, and two systems that he never played before, with two different sets of media, two different sets of eyes, two different sets of Activision, documented two different times, an 18-year-old punk did not walk in and smoke it past the world. That is not possible. It's not. That's not human error, that's not a mistake. That's a flat out lie. That's a childish lie, and you'd have to be a moron to believe it. And when I said that, I caught a lot of attention. And I also became a threat to some degree. And I'm sure that I am. Because when you do something like this to somebody, it's like anything else. You do this, and nine people put their head in their hands, or they put their head down, or they don't know what to do, or they're all upset. And I'm this, that's nine people. And then you do it, you meet number 10. And number 10 knows how to deal with it. And he comes back at you. And you have met number 10. And that's why I'm here, and that's why I agreed to this. There is nothing that can be thrown at me that I cannot document or back up. And I saw it as early as 2005. First of all, every single score that I ever did, I'm sorry, I, I got Todd's out of the way first because he has this much evidence. Mine is like this. Maybe I thought I could see into the future. But it was 2005, and there were people who were working hard, and the links are available, and Neil will have them for you. There were people hard who were working hard to show that Steve Wiebe, the other guy in King of Kong, was cheating. By the way, he has nothing to do with any of this. He's not. So in order to stack the deck in my favor, I said the Walter now... It's 2007, and just by luck, you cannot call any manufacturer, none. You cannot call them and get an engineer on the phone. Nobody can. If anybody here thinks I'm wrong, please tell me. It was only by luck that somebody got me an extension. Okay, the extension was for the head engi the senior engineer at Nintendo. I didn't know he was a senior engineer. And the movie had just come out, and I said, I'm going to play, and I want to know that this board is good. And he said, okay. He knew me. He knew the story. And he said, okay, just quietly, I'll do it for you. Okay. He, Walter Day, 
the owner of Twin Galaxies at the time is the one that facilitated the situation. The owner of Twin Galaxies sent the board off to Nintendo, or rather it was sent off to Nintendo, and when it came back, it went to the area manager of GameStop in Orlando. That manager got the board, brought it to the venue, the venue that had thousands of people. It was just like this one. It's a state venue put on by the state, which means it has all records, everything, film, checks that were written to me. Everything is documented because people say, oh, that never happened. Oh, he did it in a private room. It's all documented. But I kept being told that nothing matters except scientific evidence. And I said, I don't understand. This is all documented. Why wouldn't you want to see it? No, nope, just scientific information. And I said, well, there's scientific information on both sides, I'm sure. As a matter of fact, an attorney chimed in and said, scientific evidence is great. Can I ask, is there an attorney in the room here? Somebody be brave. Mm. All right. Both sides always have scientific. It always comes down to eyewitness testimony. Who was there? Who saw it? Who substantiated it? And multiple times. Every one of those people is available. Nope, that's all hearsay. We're only dealing with scientific information. So I said, you're not interested in what Nintendo says. Nope. I still have the box, the airway bill, the date, and everything. Because that same board that went off to Nintendo was later used by Steve Wiebe in California as he tried for a world record. Because I don't have an extra grind with him. The fact of the matter is, the area manager plugged it into the game, and he padlocked the game. He padlocked it, and nobody could get in it. And it was videotaped. He was videotaped, padlocking it. And when the score was done, he showed up two days later to remove the board from the game on video. And it was sent back to Nintendo and was certified a second time as the same board that they certified the first time. And then the report went to Twin Galaxies. There is no way that anybody could refute that, none. So I had no headaches from the movie. Three years later, two years later, with a second owner of Twin Galaxies, not the current, but a second one, they did a Twin Galaxy show called Settle It on the Screen, where they showed the Nintendo certified board, the game that I played on, and they spoke of it, and they glamorized it. We're, I'm sorry to say, we're on our fourth owner of Twin Galaxies today. The fact of the matter is none of you were told any of this, because it was so-called scientific information only. I says, there's emails here dating back to 2009. The emails state what they're going to do. The emails say what they have in plan, planned for Billy Mitchell. The emails say that he's coming down. Gee, wouldn't you like to see these? Nope. And I says, a judge would want to see them. Nope, we're only dealing with scientific information. There's film, film footage, just like that. Film footage where it's discussed exactly creating a Donkey Kong score to bring Billy Mitchell down. Exactly. He was a part of it. We saw it together. It's on the cutting room floor. It wasn't put into a particular documentary that's out there, but it will be available. It's on film, and it's not scientific. Sounds like an agenda, and obviously I started to get discouraged. Man, I'm really on a roll here, aren't I? Aren't you supposed to be doing something? No, that's okay. You think, I'm, you think I'm going to interrupt this? <laughs> <laughs> They're not here to hear me. I mean, I'm a Billy Mitchell cosplayer, but other than that, you know. Remember, self-proclaimed arbitrator, judge and jury, the one who said, 
it doesn't really matter, I told Walter, it doesn't really matter what anybody says or what they put forward. I know more about this than anybody. Yet we're all working hard to supply them with stuff. And this is the very first time in my illustrious career that I answered a naysayer. I answered a naysayer because it involved different people. The original dispute was on a score that was achieved in 2010 at Boomers. And I says, well, I don't understand. Why aren't you looking at the tape from 2010? I mean, brace yourself, guys. You didn't hear any of this. They can't find the tape. They, they, they can't find the tape. They can't find the original tape. They can't even find a copy of the game. They might have forgot to put that in the press release. Okay? They can't find it. I mean, I'm sorry. In the most corrupt court in the world, in any country, you've lost a chain of evidence, case dismissed. And that's why I asked if there's a lawyer in the room. There's one here. He just doesn't want to raise his hand. The fact of the matter is, so they said, well, we can't look at that score. Let's look at this score. They can't find the original tape of the second score. The second score doesn't have any sound. And somebody better help me here, and I know somebody who knows this. That tape has a border around it. And what does it mean when you play something and it has a border around it? You know, you better tell me. Not you, him. Oh, you, you said it. When you put something through editing equipment, it puts a border around it. There's no way around it. How could you possibly consider that? They might have forgot to mention that in the press release. It has a border around it. It has no sound. There's no voice. There's no picture. First of all, would I want to help them? And if I did, would I be able to look and say, that's my exact gameplay? No. Could I make lucky guesses? I probably could. But taking what they have, the original dispute was on the million sixty-two. But of course, we've moved down to the second score now. We've forgotten about this score. It doesn't count anymore. We're going to judge by this score. That score at a million fifty. <sighs> Sorry, I'm on a roll, losing train of thought. That score, they said, you can't make a video game play look like this. Now, I know we have some technicians in the room here. Somebody be brave and raise their hand that they've worked on video games. Man, you guys are a bunch of cow... All right, thanks, Neil. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, the most inferior monitor is an RGB. And I've gotten smarter as I go here because I wasn't this smart. I'm like a Formula One race car driver. It's my job to drive the car. Someone else has to do everything else. An RGB monitor, and then a TV monitor, and a computer monitor. Well, it uses, we used a special converter so that it recorded directly off of the board so that it was high quality play to be used later in a movie. Obviously, I like to do movies. No one had ever, ever worked with that converter at the time this dispute began. Nobody ever. That was probably important. Okay? So when I called the company that made the converter, they said, well, you're not recording off the monitor. That's why it doesn't look the same. You're recording directly from the board onto a TV. So we ran it from the board to the TV. It had the game monitor and it had a TV next to it. And it looked strikingly different. A different monitor. A higher quality monitor. Well, the actual screen has burn marks in it. Burn marks. Somebody tells me they know what burn marks is? Yeah. That could only come from a video game. Okay? There is no chance that you would record something from a TV or a computer. No chance. None. They might have forgot to mention that. Okay? So, okay, we debunked what they had to say. There was never a congratulations. There was never a, oh, gee, we learned. We didn't know. Oh, I understand. Nothing. We move the goalpost. Well, the way the board draws, 
it's drawing vertically and it should draw horizontally. No, Donkey Kong board. You play it on a TV. What do you do? Come on, smart lady. Now it's horizontal. That's why it draws in a different direction. We showed that. Oh, no recognition. We move the goalpost again. The way that it pops on the screen is not correct. Wait a minute. Three other high quality Donkey Kong players, their screens were shown on footage that's on the internet to appear the same way at different points in the game. Oh, let's move the goalpost. One problem is a screen goes 60 times a second. A regular camera, are you set for 30 frames? He's not going to catch it all. He's not going to catch it exactly. And then it's a copy. That's why we want the original. And it's a copy of a copy. And then it's from analog to digital. It's played on the TV screen, and then they film the screen. There's all loads of stuff missing. And that's why there's so much that's inconclusive. But once again, they came up with a problem. They said, well, we're recording with the converter because they now went and ordered a converter from the company that I said I ordered it from in the year 2000 and in the year 2003. So they ordered one. They actually, they ordered two. And they were testing. And for 30 days, they forgot to tell you, for 30 days, they were not able to copy it in color. Yet my scores were in color. 30 days, they're playing a Donkey Kong board in a machine that are over 30 years old on a converter that's 15 years old. Come on, mechanics. No color. Boy, Marcel, where are you? On the right. Okay. The fact of the matter is, you hear the term caps, and I didn't know any of this. I've gotten smarter. Caps dry out. Caps dry out. Okay? The caps were all dried out. They tried for a month. Our guy went in, and on the first day, he recorded 317,000 points in color. He recorded it, okay, and he sent it to him, and it was, oh. Listen, you want me to get you a drink or something? Yeah, I'm I'm good. Okay, and it was, oh, caps dry out. You replace caps. Every game out there you look at where the color isn't right, there's a cap problem. It's very common. It's the easiest thing to fix. The last thing is that our guy used a VCR that was comparable to what would have been used back then, not something from today. And I'm sure that had had an effect too. But at that point, because I walked in the room while the technician was talking to the so-called regime, and they said, oh, wow, okay, can you email that, email that? And the technician said, sure. That was about the sixth or eighth time they moved the goalpost. And at that point, they gave him about five challenges with the way the screen is populated and other ways as the challenges that they wanted answered. And I realized nobody was trying to prove that we did something. We're sitting here breaking our back to prove that we did it. This is guilty until proven innocent. And I said, this just isn't going to last. Then everything was, we're not here to discuss anything. We're just here to prove or disprove that this is MAME. That's interesting. I heard the word MAME a thousand times in a two-month period. It was crazy. There was a four-hour Facebook post. MAME, MAME, this is arcade. This is MAME. The same game looks like arcade, looks like MAME. Because the camera doesn't capture everything. Captures very little, actually, unless you have the original tapes, which I'll get to in a second. So the fact of the matter is, I realized we were never going to win this. But then I thought, wow, here it is. This is awesome. They were saying, no, this is MAME, I forget, 1.16. 
It's 1.16 to 1.12. It's the only one that has the finger. Dead in the water. The finger gives it away. You're dead in the water. There's no way around it. Gee, I thought we were okay. Gee, the board went to and from Nintendo. Gee, everybody was there. Again, mechanics. Is there anything in the world that you could plug into a Donkey Kong board? Plug in. I'm going to pick on you. Is there anything you can plug into a Donkey Kong board, excuse me, into a Donkey Kong cabinet that would play like MAME? Anything. The only thing that plugs into a Donkey Kong cabinet is a Donkey Kong board. There is no MAME Donkey Kong in the world. Somebody who knows better, correct me if I'm wrong, because there's not. It's on a computer. You can play it at home. You can do fun things here at the show. But nobody here has ever seen a Donkey Kong with a main board in it. It doesn't exist. We're chasing a ghost. But none of that mattered. Because I couldn't believe it when it was sent to me. It's here. It's real. It's off of the MAME website. MAME 116 to 1.22 was developed and became available. Don't fall down in the back. Became available three years after I submitted the score. For the first time, you could play it three years later. Period. End of paragraph. Notice the press release no longer says it's MAME. They just say that they don't think it's arcade. It was nothing that was ever going to be won. It was never going to be done. But I'm going to go back to common sense first. And you know I'm picking on you. I said I wanted to do this score. I said I wanted to do it in the summer of 2010. Now brace yourself, that was kind of tough for me. Because after I did a perfect score on Pac-Man, that had Twin Galaxies officials there, it was in a public place with 300 people breathing down my neck. Because I announced it ahead of time. Because I sent out a press release. Because I did it on a holiday weekend at the largest arcade in the world. Okay, because there was media there, because it was being filmed over my shoulder. It was the year 1989. The converter we used didn't become available for the first time until the year 2000. And in 1999, I had no idea we would start making movies. So what happened was, <clears throat> what happened was I lost my train of thought. <laughs> But, um, What happened was I wanted to do this score in 2010, and I had not submitted a score of any kind, okay, since before the turn of the century. I mean, I got the Video Game Player of the Century Award, and I kind of had a sigh of relief. I'm like, oh, man, there's nothing left. I don't have to do anything else. I can kind of relax. I can play. I can have fun. Anybody here that I ever meet, and they say, can I play a game? Sure, we go over and play a board. Believe me, I like that a lot better. My dad told me once, when you're young, you like going to the carnival and you like going on the rides. When you get to be a certain age, you like watching your kids go on the rides. Well, that was it. I get more kick out of watching you guys play than I do out of playing myself. So it was a big step for me in 2010 to say I'm going to do this on Donkey Kong. This is it one last final time. And I practiced tremendously leading up to it, and I didn't tell a soul. Then I announced that I was going to do it. The arcade is the largest arcade in the world. It doesn't have a Donkey Kong. Gee, that's a crying shame, isn't it? By the way, there's no Donkey Kong here. I was going to play here. There's no Donkey Kong. So again, those of you who are in the industry, we called the local distributor, who was a great guy who would do anything for anybody. He has a Donkey Kong. He has a personal Donkey Kong in his home that he had a guy, Matt, go and pick up. 
Does anybody here think it's possible that a distributor, a real distributor, a distributor who's a distributor of Namco games and every other game, has a game, has a personal game, says it's a Donkey Kong, says it's a real Donkey Kong. Does anybody here think it's possible that that's not true or he doesn't know what he's talking about? That's not possible. Okay, Matt picked it up. Matt set it up. That's what Matt does for a living. Okay. Matt got paid. Okay. The owner of Grand Prix, he said it was okay. The manager had him bring it in. He set it up. The technician came and put the settings on there that are tournament settings. Is it possible that he could put the settings on a board and think it's a main board? Those of you people who know MAME here, I wish somebody would spit something out. That is not possible. It's not. There is no such thing. Okay? Then three, three scoreboard officials showed up. Three of them. Three. Okay? Along with my friend who set the recording through the converter because nobody knew what the converter was. And it was recorded. And the game was recorded. And there's witnesses. And it... And there's a room camera, just like one of these, nine feet in the air, viewing down on the area. It took six-hour tapes. They're part of the record. They were turned in. But I had referees there. I had, I had scoreboard officials there. I don't have to record the game. I'm recording the game for my purpose. So when we do a movie, I got it. It's a better movie. And just so you know, I'm not that nice of a guy. Yeah, I got more leverage. I want the money. I got kids. Okay? There are over 3,000 tapes. One place in the Northeast. One place in the Midwest. And two in the South. Over 3,000 game tape world records that have not yet been collected by the scoreboard, by the current regime, who has owned it for four years. Has there been due diligence done? There are f four years. And I says, do you have the tapes yet? Oh, we're working on it. Wait, what, you're gonna make, just, the original's gotta be in there. The original's gotta be in there. I mean, putting it in the game, locking the game, it's got to be in there. The room shot, showing me play all that time. And here's the kicker. When I finished playing Donkey Kong, when I got the score, and I turn around, who's standing behind me? At the time, the owner of Twin Galaxies, who shook my hand and said, congratulations, Mr. Mitchell, you did it. And it's on film. A week later, I was honored at the Video Game Hall of Fame with him standing next to the table, all happy and smiling with no concern whatsoever. Those tapes were handed over to the referees. Those referees of those days will state in writing, yes, I saw the tapes. Yes, we brought them back to the room. Did you watch them? No, we didn't watch them. We didn't have to watch them because the score was done live in front of TG personnel. To be honest with you, it's not that fun to watch, not when you're a referee. So they decided they didn't have to watch it. Like I said, after that, it was all glorified. I was unsettled on the screen. I said, did anybody express concern at the time? No, nobody. I said, did the owner, his name was Pete, did Pete express any concern? No, not at all. When did you last see the tapes? I last saw the tapes in the morning when they went out of the room. Do you know where they are now? No. Two possibilities. The third score was recorded not into a VCR, but into a laptop. It could be that the tape is too clean and nobody wants it to be seen. What's more likely is, I'm sorry to say with bad news, 
is there was a falling out between that owner and basically every referee. And many of them told me that they took their stuff and threw it in a dumpster. I don't have any ill will towards anybody. My lucky guess is along with a lot of other stuff, it was chucked and thrown in the dumpster. I don't care. I don't care. Okay? But those originals, the cop, there are no copies. That's crazy to me. And the lower scores, where there's no originals, but there is copies, okay, those scores were in one of the four libraries of tapes that I spoke of. And the person who's a caretaker of one of those libraries said, yes, they were here. And yes, when my brother was here, she, yes, they came here and they took a Donkey Kong tapes, perfect Pac-Man tape, which has been missing for more than eight years, about 10 years now. They took my friend's perfect Pac-Man tape. Both of those tapes showed up in a movie, an internet movie. Both of them were edited. What you see on the screen is different from what we have. Nothing I'm telling you is not available or not on tape or anything. Nothing. Going back, the distributor, the arcade owner, the manager, all of which are available today. Okay, the technician, the guy who delivered the game, the Twin Galaxies officials. Does anybody really think that all of those people made a mistake? Does anybody really think that it's somehow something that doesn't exist in this world got smoked past all of them? When they began this dispute, they had no idea, because I don't talk, <clears throat> they had no idea that all of this was here and available, and that there was the paper trail. The paper trail, the email that he will show you, that says, please have your, in 2009, please have your Asian technician call me. A particular guy sent me the email that some, that a naysayer sent to him. Please have your particular, please have your Asian technician call me. I need his help to create a Donkey Kong score. I think he's a genius and he can help me. A second email at a later time said, I'm working for a company now and I'm learning how to modify boards. Those are real emails that run through Yahoo. And when you have it and it has that date and Yahoo says that it came from them, you cannot manipulate that. You cannot. That same name is the same name that took the tapes out of the library. That same name is the same name that edited the two Pac-Man scores, okay, that show up in the YouTube movie. I'm almost out, so I'm struggling here. I just, so that's just wild to me. We only accept scientific evidence. All of this doesn't count. Well, somebody said that they viewed your, or they adjudicated your tape. Who? We don't want to tell you. Okay, you're going to take somebody's word that they adjudicated the tape, but you're not going to take the word of all these witnesses who were involved in it. That's wild to me. You're going to tell me that in 1982, in front of the cameras of Life magazine, and 16 of the world's best video game players inside the Twin Galaxies Arcade, where I did 874,000 in the first kill screen in Donkey Kong history that wasn't duplicated for more than 20 years. You want to somehow tell me there was a misunderstanding and that didn't happen. There's a reason for all that that I'll get to at the end. If I don't take a break, yeah. then there won't be any questions. And I don't mean to sound funny. I'm serious. And I have no ill will against anybody. Man, ask some questions. 
you walk out of here and say something silly when you had the opportunity to ask give me the chance to say something silly don't be bashful and I mean it but almost everything I've said here none of you have heard so wh why should we believe what you're saying I said I have it all documented here I have the fact that it was going to happen if I could go over one more thing I don't want to say that it doesn't bother me because there's other people involved. My friend Rob, who set it up, he's a liar. The distributor's a liar. The technician's a liar. All of them. So that, yeah, that bothers me. I've had naysayers for more than a decade. Okay, and I just totally ignored them. Totally. Naysayers who the FBI are now investigating. It's right here for anyone who wants to see it because of the emails they sent, the sexual content, and it involves a 10-year-old girl. They screwed up. The FBI cannot tell me no to that. If I say this guy's has harassing me, they would tell me to grow up. But when they put the name of a 10-year-old girl in here, no. Now they screwed up, and everything in the world can be traced. I don't care who you think you are. It's right here. My wife will have it. My son went to visit. She, she runs a Twitter. My son, who is a nationally ranked athlete with a very high GPA, he went to visit Cornell, Harvard, Columbia, Rutgers, um, Georgia, Florida, Miami, a bunch. Each time she went somewhere, she put it on Twitter. They followed. I mean, I want to hit some people here that have kids. They followed those coaches. They followed those recruiters. They sent them emails and said, you're really going to consider this kid whose father associates with pedophiles. They tried to derail my son's... <clears throat> I'm not going to get upset. My son's education. It's here. Nobody tell me that I'm making it up. And nobody say, how do I believe you? It's here. It's on the Twitter page. You can look at it. All the way back to my son's seventh grade football coach. The coaches of those universities, a couple of them shared it with me. Of course, they weren't successful, but that's beside the point. Anybody who would do something like this is the most vile person in the world. So I've gained a new attitude because all I did is laugh at these people that sit in their basement, that smell, okay, that are 40 years old, who never come to an event. They're jealous crybabies who want to do nothing but be worshipped from behind the keyboard. The different people, I'm pointing to you two, the different people who run conventions like this have received emails being harassed not to let Billy Mitchell and Walter Day or Todd Rogers come to their show. You can ask them. They don't show up here. They don't do what we do. They don't even come to the show. They just bitch, whine, moan, groan, complain, bellyache. Why not me? And I'm not going to apologize for my success. I'm not going to apologize for the hard work. And I long for the day, without lying to you, that I get back to where I completely ignore them. But for this, I don't have to. And just so you want to know how successful Jason the Box is, I don't say Jack in the Box, I say Jason the Box. Okay, the situation with Namco is solid as a rock. Okay, the situation with Nintendo is solid as a rock. My situation here, or Florida Replay, we can go on and on, is solid as a rock. Okay, I'm supposed to go to Australia. I'm not going to go because I'm not going to miss my son's football game. I mean, I know that's wacky. I'm sorry. We're going to go to England. Okay. Maybe they're going to jump off a mountain when they hear all this. It was all for nothing. I have never had a negative encounter, including here. 
with anybody who comes up here. I've never, I've had people come up and express regret. They've said all the right things. You can count these people. You couldn't feel your finger, but they're loud, they're obnoxious, and they found a friend, a shock jock, who wanted an agenda. And it began with Todd. And the reason why he wanted it, I'll give you at the end. I really do promise I'll be quiet now. <laughs> You, you missed it. I was quiet for about 10 seconds. So um, one of the first questions I actually wanted to ask is uh, on this. I might have already answered it. You, you actually answered all like nine or 10 of my questions, but it, it's why I want to just sit here and listen. But this, the title of this panel is called Road to Redemption. What does redemption mean to you? What do you want redemption to be? Okay. Well, there's no way... That anybody of any respect is going to get are going to be able to put across the idea that everything remember I said there was 2010 and then there was nothing before that until 1999 and back so let's go to 1999 and back nobody with any respect is going to be able to put up a case every single score was done at an event. The reason why the old Guinness rules were you couldn't videotape a score. There were no webcams. You had to do it at a Twin Galaxies event under Twin Galaxies observation. It was far stricter back then than it is now. I think the first score that was accepted by video was after the year 2000. I think it was uh, Tim Zerby. But the fact of the matter is Twin Galaxies was at every score. It was, he was the head. It was him and his constituents. He was contracted by Guinness for other world records, nothing video game related. There was a guy on a flagpole that sat up there for 342 days. And you think I'm sick? He was on a flagpole for 342 days and he finally came down. And on behalf of Guinness, Walter was contracted there to meet him. The strength and the relationship he has with Guinness is far greater than anything else. Twin Galaxies had an exclusive. They were the only ticket into Guinness. Now, there are many different <coughs> groups that submit to Guinness. You can submit directly to Guinness yourself. Before, it was through Twin Galaxies, nothing else. So him and his constituents were there at their location, at their event, for every single one. So that's very easily going to be recognized. So when somebody, nice people, come up to me and says, man, that's crazy. I can't believe they, they want to do that about your Pac-Man score. Don't worry about it. Please forget that. But what I don't want them to do is to say that the Donkey Kong scores are okay because I'm going to go back and I'm just going to redo them. And without lying to you, I have done it. I did it at home. I have never turned in a score from home. Ever, and I'm not going to now. Something you see in the movie, okay? The tape that was sent with, she calls herself Old Lady Doris. That's her word. I don't call her Old Lady. Okay, that tape was sent. First of all, that wasn't a tape. That was a blank. Documentaries are scripted, I'm sorry to say. The actual tape that was shown there was something that I sent to Brian Koo for his own entertainment. So he showed it. Okay, And again, I don't need that done. I'll simply redo them at a live venue like here if they had a Donkey Kong. And not that great big Donkey Kong either. That's not an official Donkey Kong. And um, that would start a whole new controversy. So yes, the scores outside of Donkey Kong, don't worry about a bit. The other ones I'll do. Not only will I do them, I'm going to do the exact score exact score and just let the game die you mean you're not going to go higher even if you can no why because I'm Billy Mitchell <laughs> and I'm going to make a statement so like I said what I've done at home I'll keep to myself just as I had in the past one last thing if I could say something nice about myself when I have done scores on different machines 
and they were higher than the world record, but I didn't do it under the proper observation. I don't tell anybody about it because I feel like that's pissing on somebody else's score. They did it under proper observation, so I have to. And I'm just, I'm going to stick by the old rules where you do it at a venue. I'm not going to do a garage score. I'm sorry, what I was going to say was the scores at the time of the movie, I did it in a public venue at a convention in Orlando. Okay, the other guy's score was done in his garage. The movie would lead you to believe otherwise. That's not so. And I don't have any ill will. They were out to make a movie. They made a great movie. Okay? I don't say they did things right or wrong. I just say they were out to make a movie. And then I have no problem with it. Because it was a good movie. All I can do is steer my own ship. I can't control anyone else. Well, speaking of steering the ship, I'm being told that I'm supposed to steer the ship into port. And so... uh I think that's it. Thank you so much. You want to see an email? He's got papers. You want to see the... I mean, is that rotten or what? Yeah. Okay. I've been looking at it. You want to see an email? You want to see tweets? You want to see anything? Don't be bashful. If you just want a handshake, don't be bashful. There are some people in this room that walk past me like, really? You come up to me, you can ask me anything. Nothing will offend me. It won't. I don't give short answers, though, so brace yourself. I'm sorry, did you want to ask your second question? I'm not allowed anymore. And I hope that I... Well, what do you got going here that you got to run everybody out of here? I'm sorry about that. Um, I can think of a lot of things I miss, so... Um, it takes time to put together... And I can only harass people so much to put things together. Everybody has jobs, families, lives, time. So things are coming together however quickly they can. So. Stay tuned. Well, you wanted one last thing, though. One last thing. You, listen up. Make sure I got it right. It was August of last year when this so-called dispute thread was created. Many of the things that I said were substantiated on different people's Facebooks. And the answer from the regime was, too bad it's not on the thread where we can consider it. Too bad. The fact of the matter is, it doesn't matter where it is. I says, it's your job, it's evidence. Not if it's not on the dispute thread. And of course, that's where my line comes in. A judge will think differently. But getting past that for a second, that dispute thread had 20,000 unique hits in a month or thereabouts. Okay? That was in August. By the end of January, when Todd's situation was wrapping up, it was over two million people get paid on hits. And I'm told, although I haven't seen, I have what it is that shows the amount of hits to the end of January. You can see it, over two million. I'm told that it went to four million with me because this is how you create conversation, okay? I'm told that's a 20,000% increase. So take your phone and your calculator and put in there, I don't want to know how much, you just put in there however much money your paycheck is when you get it, and that hit times 20,000%. Do that. And never ever wonder what people will do for money. There are plenty of people who will sell their soul for money. And if I can say one last thing about somebody nice, that's, and I'm told that's 20,000% increase. Man, is that really right? I'd like somebody to tell me no, because that's outrageous. And I don't mean to sound funny. If I'm making somebody that much money, I usually get a little portion of it. 
But in 2005, when the other guy in the movie, and he has nothing to do with this, he submitted a score of Donkey Kong, and it was a good score. And it was even a record score at the time. He submitted it, and the truth came. You can listen real closely in the movie, real closely, and you can hear as he plays Donkey Kong that you're hearing Donkey Kong Jr. sounds. You know what I'm talking about. Because he played on a board that was not an authentic board. So when the truth came out, he's not a bad guy. He played on a different board. His score was taken, and nobody knows this, from a Donkey Kong category to double Donkey Kong category. That's what happened, and life went on. Nobody who owned the company did that and tried to ride on that guy's back for whatever money they could. He simply moved it because that's what was right to do and not because he wanted to tarnish anybody. Today's people, hits are money, and he created hits. He did a good job. You ought to see he's in a new building. It's an awesome building. Um, that's just not anything I'll ever be a part of. He is permanently shelved. I'm not blind to the fact that in the classic gaming world, my name has a lot of fun. And I'm going to ride with the good people and not with the others. And that's the only protest I can do. But that's why he did it. If you don't take this thing away from me, I'm going to keep talking. Yeah, I shut it off. Drop the mic. Oh, I missed it. Mm-hmm.